Settle in class, cause we finally have it. How to play Pathfinder. We've already covered how to fill in your character sheet, and today we're finally gonna go over how to use it. I'm not gonna be going into the details of every status or rule, but instead give a general framework so you can learn as you go and understand the rules you look up. We'll start with general roles, move on to combat, and then finish off with some extra things specifically for people coming over from D&D &D 5e. You ready? Let's go! So first things first, let's get the premise out of the way. The GM is the Game Master. They're the ones running the adventure, telling you what's around you, and resolving any rule issues. A good one will listen to the group and try to make decisions that are best for everyone. Now what they say might go against the book or me or your favorite YouTuber or show, but you go with their ruling over the rules. There's nothing wrong with letting them know a rule if they're just unaware and trying to come up with something, but if they decide that's not what they want to do, drop it. The rules I'm about to explain are the default, the foundation everything's built on. Every GM's table is customized over time, so your game might look a little different, but it's still best to know the basics of the rules so we're all speaking the same language. We'll start with the most basic rule, how to navigate the world. You tell your GM what you want to do, and if there's any difficulty to the task, they'll have you roll your 20-sided dice. Add the right number and compare it to the difficulty set by the GM. That is called a skill check, and it is the foundation of everything in this game. Roll below the target number and you fail, hit that number or more and you succeed. If you fail or succeed by 10 or more, you just rolled a critical. These will often, though not always, have an additional effect. For example, a critical success while attacking means you do double damage, or a critical Failure when treating a wound means you accidentally hurt him. Success? fail, critical success, and critical fail are your four stages of success. And one more little twist, rolling a 20 on the die will bring it up one stage, and rolling a 1 will bring it down one stage. So this natural 20 can save anyone from disaster, but it wouldn't let my tiny witchy arms choke slam a dragon. And that right there is the foundation of basically everything. This is why you want to have a good bonus to your rolls. And thankfully, that number is already on your character sheet. So if you're wanting to try and backflip over the orc instead of going around it, you would roll and add your acrobatic score. Easy but sometimes an effect or spell might modify that. So let's take a look at modifiers and penalties. And don't worry, this is going to sound a lot more complicated than it actually is. Ability and proficiency modifier are only really messed with at level up, so we don't have to worry about them. Item is given by equipment, like lockpicks helping you pick locks, so it's also already in that formula. Circumstance is something in your environment that helps or hurts you, like a penalty to acrobatics because you're on ice. You'll be told this one when you roll, so you don't really have to learn anything, just add a 2 or whatever when you're told. So the only one that requires any thought is status, which comes from things like spells or poison. They work the same way, just a plus or minus something, but there's usually a duration or something you're going to have to remember. Now what makes this easy is you only ever use the biggest bonus and biggest penalty for each type. So if three different people poison you for minus one, you just take the minus one. Nearly everything falls into one of these two categories, so you're usually only worried about one or two mid-game, especially at the early levels when you're learning. There are a few exceptions called untyped penalties, which do stack, but they're usually called caused by your own abilities and can be written down in advance. Now I know that sounds really complicated, but it's really easy when you're actually doing it. Here, watch. Hey boss, let me take them keys out of that guy. Sure, minus one because he's jumpy from that attack last night. Okay, you got a 10, that's a 28 with my thievery, so a 27. Okay, you got the key. Yeah. You know what else I'm stealing? Minus eight this time, bud. Here we go again. 12, so 30 minus 8 is 22. Oh, I've been waiting for that. The guard notices and stir. Wait, um, I forgot to cast Nudge Bait. Can I do that? That won't really- I'll make a diversion. Fine, fine. The great shoelace bandit claims another victim. <laughs> See, it sounds hard because there's a bunch of possibilities, but it's pretty simple in practice because you're only using a couple. It also really helps to keep everyone at around the same strength. The player who memorized the book will have some advantage, but they won't be able to blast past you with 17 piled up bonuses. They just get the big. Now there's plenty of statuses and specific rules, but if you're new you only need to know the ones that you can cause and how dying and wounded works, and I'll be getting to that in a moment. The rest will be explained by whoever's inflicting them on you. Now here's the fun part, nearly everything we do in this system is just a check with a different formula or twist. Normal skill checks are actually some of the more complicated ones, most don't really change outside level up. Saving throws are just skill checks with different stats, flat checks are skill checks without adding anything. My point is that with this knowledge you can basically navigate the world, at least until you get to a scenario where every moment matters. This could be a heated argument or a timed puzzle, but let's just say we're creeping through a dungeon and find some goblins creeping right back. This is where Pathfinder becomes turn-based, and we'll start by seeing who goes first. The GM tells everyone to roll initiative, and turn order goes from highest to lowest. By default, this is a perception check, but your GM can make it something different if it makes sense for the scenario. Once we have our order, we start taking turns, and when everyone's had their turn, it's called a round. Now our order can change throughout combat, so when most abilities refer to a round, they're specifically talking 
talking about from your current turn until your next turn. Every round is 6 seconds long, with everyone's turns happening at about the same time. On each of your turns, there are all sorts of things you can do, and Pathfinder is best known for how simple they've made it. On your turn, you take 3 actions, then pass it to the next person. Attack twice and run, move 3 times, you use your 3 actions, and then your turn ends. Attacking, running, taking out your sword, trying to get information about the monster you're facing, most things you can think of default to one action. And as for the exceptions, they're easy to see at a glance because all of your abilities have a handy little symbol next to them. One diamond means one action, two or three means two or three actions, and if there's an empty diamond, that's a free action. It's something that takes no time, like dropping something you're holding. You can use these as many times as your GM finds reasonable, but your GM is allowed to stop you if you're trying to do like 20 things in 6 seconds. So you get 3 actions per turn, and the diamond next to the ability tells you how many it costs to use. Makes perfect sense, right? Well, I got one more curveball. The reaction. It can only be used in a situation listed by the ability, known as a trigger. You only get one reaction around, but it doesn't use an action, and you can even use it on other people's turn. For example, if you get pushed off a cliff, you can try to grab the edge as a reaction. The trigger is you falling, so it doesn't matter if it's not your turn, you can still try to save yourself. But if someone immediately tries to shove you off again before your next turn, you can't save yourself because you've already used your reaction. Sometimes free actions will have triggers as well, and if they do, they can be used on other people's turns. You just can't use multiple actions per trigger. So if you have three abilities, but the trigger of you fail a saving throw, you do have to pick one. So to recap, actions are on your turn, free actions are on your turn unless they say otherwise, and reactions are on anyone's turn, but only under the listed scenario. And if you forgot any of the symbols for these, your standard character sheet puts a reference right above your ability score. Hey, uh, mic cut out. Really? Fine. Right above your ability score. Nope. Okay, I know this mic's almost as old as I am, but this is... Oh, they're doing a rework. Should we delay? No, this already took three months and we took a vacation over it. Thankfully, the rules updates are minor. It's mostly just name changes to escape D&D's grabby claws, as well as some stuff from later books and some minor rules updating. Whatever, the ability modifiers were all that mattered anyway. The main change seems to be switching the player's alignment system for an optional system of moral codes. Edicts and anathemas, you already had these for classes. They're also releasing the change list for free, and those of us with the PDFs will eventually get them updated. Thankfully, nothing we're talking about today seems to be affected outside of wording, so don't worry about it if I say spell level and your future book says spell rank. We good? Oh, and to further cement this as that moment where I go off topic to give your brain a break from the rules, here's the part where I ask you to push random buttons below the video. You know the drill already. And now let's finish with the combat part of combat. Everyone's gonna be moving around the battlefield, each space counting as 5 feet. But of course, the most important part of ending a fight is attacking with striking and spell casting. In the simplest of terms, striking is another skill check. Roll your 20-sided die, add that appropriate formula that you already figured out, and throw in your modifiers or penalties. Instead of the GM coming up with a target number, you're trying to hit their enlisted armor class. Of course, most GMs won't tell you that number. Working it out through trial and error is part of the excitement. Once you do know it, you can more easily figure out how many times you want to attack. Because you can attack with all three actions, but every time you do so in a turn gets an untyped penalty to your next one. So it's often better to bury your turn with movement or raising a shield to increase your own AC, or using one of the many abilities you get from your class and ancestry. Of course, that's assuming you're using a weapon or fighting them or something. The other main way to attack is by casting spells. There's plenty of classes that can waggle their fingers and warp reality, but the effects are so buried you actually have to read what the spell does. We have the name, what type of spell it is, and its spell level. Below are the tags, which are mostly just reference. Sometimes a monster will be immune to enchantment or something. Just make sure to pay attention if it says attack, because those take the multiple attack penalty like striking does. Anyway, Tradition or Domain tells you what types of casters can use it. You'll learn what type you are when you pick your class. Cast is how long it takes. Usually one of the discussed action symbols, but some of the stronger ones can take minutes or hours of uninterrupted work. And if it's a reaction, you'll also see what triggers it here. This also tells you how you cast it. Verbal means you cast by talking. Somatic means you have to have your hands free. And if you need something else, like an ingredient or a focus, it'll list it here. This usually won't matter in battle, but it's very important if you're being sneaky or get tied up. So for example, Air Bubble is a level 1 spell. It can be used by arcane casters like wizards, divine casters like clerics, and primal casters like druids. It's a reaction with the trigger of not being able to breathe, so you can cast it as soon as you get dunked underwater. You'll also see a description here that says it lets you breathe, and above that it says it lasts for one minute. Now duration of one minute means it lasts for one minute. Duration of up to one minute means you have to spend an action each round sustaining it. Either way, it keeps going no matter how far away you move afterward. Speaking of which, we skipped an important part. Target 
area, and range. Range is how far away you can cast the spell from, so you can save a drowning buddy up to 60 feet away. Some spells affect a certain number of targets, but if we look at something like Burning Hands, we'll see an area instead. Instead of a particular target, this spell affects everyone within a certain area, in this case a 15-foot cone. And since there's no range listed, that means it comes from us. So Burning Hands has you take two actions to wave your hands and scream, shooting fire in a 15-foot cone. It does 2d6 of damage, but it can be heightened. This is a level 1 spell, but you can use this as a level 2 spell and add an extra 2d6 of fire damage. You'll also see a saving throw here. Spells that affect other people either have you make an attack roll, which is just like a normal strike but with your spellcasting modifier, or them make a saving throw. It's another skill check with a different set of scores. The DC is based on your proficiency and your class's key ability score. If you have any reason to worry about it, you'll already have it written down. If they succeed on the saving throw, they take half damage. If they critically succeed, they take no damage. But if they fail, they take full damage. And if they critically fail, they take double damage. And this applies to all damage spells requiring a basic saving throw. Burning hands, fireball, you name it. Non-damaging spells usually have their own effects as well. Let's look at one of the more terrifying new spells as an example. Other stuff has you choose one target within 30 feet. That creature makes a fortitude saving throw to see how they handle you magically cramming a full meal down their throat. It doesn't do damage, but it does have a variety of effects based on their save, like being sickened or moving slower. And there's the biggest divide between casters and most martial characters. Martial being those who rely on mundane things like clubs and arrows. Casters are very consistent, not only having a wide variety of things they can do, but almost always doing something even on a failure. Meanwhile, your martial characters can do incredible damage by just stabbing repeatedly, or using special techniques to repeatedly bonk someone with style. However, a mundane weapon is hit or miss. It does great damage or absolutely nothing. They can't beat a weapon when it comes to hurting one person, but casters make up for it with area of effect and utility. Everything from shrinking people to covering them in eyes. I know that in this edition, a fighter with a long sword can have more rock killing power, but I am far more terrified of someone whose first reaction is to warp reality to shrink me and fill me with pie. Or cursing me to be a clown. Why can I not escape the clowns? You okay? My tooth exploded. What? Anyway, with that you have most of your basics. Most things just involve rolling a d20 and adding the proper stat. Reduce their HP to zero before they can do the same to you. If it does, your turn gets moved to right before your attacker, you're unconscious until you stop being at zero, and you're dying. Dying one to be exact. What that means is you make a flat check. No bonus, no nothing. DC 10 plus that dying number. That number goes up one on a failure or if you get hit, down one on a success, and double that on a crit. You hit dying four, you're dead. Hit dying zero or get healed at any point, and you're no longer dying. You're wounded. Next time you start dying, you add that wounded number to your dying number. So wounded 1 means you start at dying 2. Good news though, wounded is easy to get rid of. Just spend 10 minutes making a medicine check or an hour resting at full HP. Problem solved. And by the way, a lot of your common conditions are going to have these numbers. Most conditions will have some sort of twist on how things work, like needing two successes to reduce the number or making you weaker the higher the number is. But you won't really need to know these conditions until they're affecting you. And then the person inflicting it can just tell you how it works. Just try to make sure that you know how it works if you're the one causing the effect. Please actually read the effects of your spell or ability before you use it. And really, that's my advice in general. Start by focusing on what you have on your character sheet. You'll learn the rest of the rules eventually. As long as you're actually trying, most people are fine helping a newbie. I would still recommend looking through that playing the game section of your book, but this should be enough for you to learn on the fly. Very few people know all of the rules, but it's fine because Pathfinder's about cooperation. We work together. Now here's that point where I shift from general advice to stuff for 5e converts. So if that's not you, thank you so much for giving me a shot. I hope I helped, and there's more videos on Pathfinder and D&D on the way. Hit that sub button if you want to see them. Thanks for the watch either way though. Now to my regulars. Hey. Okay, first off, don't worry too much about that multiple attack penalty. There's plenty of ways to reduce it or avoid it. There are feats that let you attack multiple times before the penalty is added, or attack every enemy in range, or make one attack that hits with a force of multiple. So if you just want to be a basic brick house that gets a couple of good swings around and nothing else, that is an option, it's just not necessarily the default. Also, opportunity attacks aren't the default here. Nothing has them unless specifically stated. Fighters get them, and a few other classes can choose them as a feat, but it's pretty rare for a monster to have them. Because of that, they're also much better. You can make an attack when an enemy tries to move out of your range, or through your range, or tries to use an item while in range, or even tries to make a ranged attack. And a crit can disrupt the action, so you can stop a hobgoblin from healing with a potion. Run around, back away, mix your attacks and movements and abilities. 
It's uncommon enough that you usually feel safe to try, but with that underlying tension that maybe you found one of the few dragons that can punish you for it. It can make for much more dynamic battles, especially with variable spells. Some spells let you choose how many actions you want to use, with different effects depending on how many actions you pump into them. More projectiles, bigger area, more damage, additional conditions or effects. It gives you versatility and a great risk reward factor. So if you just need the effect of the one or two action version, ditch that final action so you can run or cast another spell. There's no limit here. Use three spells in one round, then a fourth as a reaction. It's fine. And look, the rumors you heard about caster nerfs are only partially true. It's mainly just single target blaster casters that took a relative hit. Casters in general are not underpowered. The roles are just a tad more limited and people aren't used to fighters being better at something. Now I will admit I'm a bit biased because I was already focused on battlefield control and effects, but the caster that loves to save their slots for the boss is still gonna have fun. There's plenty of damage spells that don't have a penalty for throwing out multiple. You're just generally more focused on being tricky now, and with so many more and better spell options, it can really be fun. And that goes for martial characters too. You're doing amazing damage but get enough cool abilities that you won't feel left out when the sorcerer pulls out the dragon claws. They really try to focus the game towards everyone working together and bouncing off of each other, instead of just competing for damage numbers. Not only is it harder to make one character vastly stronger than everyone, many of your abilities are designed around helping your allies. Good alone but stronger as a team is the core of this system. Oh and by the way, gold actually means something again, and so do magic items. You know that whole three item attunement limit that 5e has? Well it's 10 in this one. Magic is everywhere, and instead of just plus one weapons, it's almost always new attacks and abilities and such. Even more ways you can customize your character. Go wild, you're expected to. And before we end this, one more thing. Those tags I said to mostly ignore, there is a set of three that you need to watch out for, especially if you're using an online resource. Common, uncommon, rare. Common means go ahead and grab it unless otherwise told. It's standard for everyone. Uncommon means you're typically locked into a specific ancestry, class, region, something. Unless you're one of the groups it's pointed toward, make sure you get your GM approval before you take it. And rare means off limits unless the GM says so. They're official, maybe even balanced. But unless the GM has specifically told you you can be a zombie or a sentient toy, you gotta back down. This system lets them keep adding tons of cool things through adventure modules and stuff without having to worry about it bogging down the main game or giving you thousands of feats to sort through. Something to keep in mind when you're using online resources, and please use online resources like the officially licensed and sponsored Archives of Nethys, with every sourcebook in searchable form as a reference, which also makes the amount of rules far less daunting. Paizo's always been great about allowing open resources and letting the game stand on its own merit, scraping by on adventure paths and expansions and merch. Anyway, I would keep rambling forever if you let me, and you can't exactly stop me, so I'll just cut it here. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to leave a tip, there's a link to my copy in description. Big thanks to my top supporters for the month, Sergeant Daniels, Feral Goblin, and Modern Masquerade. It's thanks to you that I have a chair and headphones now. Shark for scale. And to show off my shark. Class dismissed.